In the circumstances of the revelation, it's called the Azbab al-Nazul, the time in Muhammad's life in which a particular part of the Quran was given to him, supposedly by Allah. And the circumstances of the revelation, the things that were said and done at that time, often have a great deal to do with how the thing is understood today and in what way it infects Muslim practice. And so I discuss tafsir and hadith in this book insofar as they illuminate elements of Muhammad's life that are used today by the jihad terrorists to justify their actions because that is going to, as I say, keep happening if we don't confront it. Sira is the biography of Muhammad. I wrote a Sira. Karen Armstrong has written Siras, and but the classic Siras are the early ones that were written by pious Muslims to give Muslims themselves a view of who Muhammad was and what he did. And that is uh, the primary source for my book the Sira of Ibn Ishaq, which was the earliest written by a Muslim, and it's the basic source for uh, Muslim understanding of who Muhammad was and what he did. There are others that I used also that are almost as early, and together with the Hadith, the Sira forms the Sunnah, which is accepted practice. It is the pattern of behavior that Muslims must follow. It covers virtually every aspect of life. It's very extensive. And a Sunni Muslim is one who follows the Sunnah, one who follows the uh, practice as it has been delineated by Muhammad in his words and actions. What do you think the top three misconceptions about Muhammad are, and why does it matter? Probably, of course, the first one is that because he is the founder of a great religion, he must be somebody who taught general benevolence and the equality of dignity of all people before God and the necessity to love your neighbor in, in some. Uh, this is something that he did not teach. He taught a very strong dichotomy that is set out, I think, very clearly and crisply in the Quran itself when it says in chapter 48, verse 29, Muhammad is the apostle of Allah. Those who follow him are merciful to one another, but ruthless to the unbelievers. Now that dichotomy, being merciful to the Muslims but ruthless to the non-Muslims, goes once all the way through Islamic law and tradition and theology, as well as Islamic history. And so that in itself shows why it matters, because Muslims have behaved in that way and been ruthless to the unbelievers throughout history, operating according to his dictum, Muhammad's dictum, that non-believers should be either converted to Islam or subjugated as inferiors under the rule of Islamic law. And so we need to be aware of this because this, not American policy in Iraq and not American policy toward Israel and not any of the other things that are commonly adduced as root causes for Islamic anger toward the West, that is what is underlying Islamic violence. Right. That is so important. And it, it seems like there's a disconnect because so many people are ignorant about that imperative and yeah. that its roots um, in Islamic history and in the model of Muhammad because people don't have no clue about all of that history when they see Adam Gadan get in front of a camera and repeat this mantra of convert or die or when we saw the Fox News reporters um, and the kidnappers motivation convert or die people automatically assume that America is to blame for that and exactly. <laughs> not Muhammad. Yes. And, of course, the issue becomes even more confused because the Islamic terrorists themselves so frequently criticize America, and they do so in a way that particularly conservatives find a resonance with because they see, well, America is immoral. Mm -hmm. There is an awful lot of, of immorality and a lot of things that we would like to change in, in the American society. However, it's completely out of focus to think that if those things were changed, the moral issues for conservatives or foreign policy issues for liberals, that this problem would go away. We could be the most virtuous people on the planet and have nothing to do whatsoever with any other country, avoiding foreign entanglements like George Washington said to, and have nothing to do with anybody else. And they would still be waging jihad against us because it is not based on the quality of the unbelievers, it is based on the fact that we are unbelievers, and this is rooted in Muhammad's teaching to make war against the unbelievers. We get out of Iraq. Mm -hmm. That doesn't end the war. Certainly not. Right. Uh, certainly, I believe that the democracy project is one that was flawed from the beginning, 
also because of things having to do with the life of Muhammad. That Muhammad was a political leader, and Islam is a political entity. It has always been such. As a matter of fact, the year one of the Islamic calendar is not what Westerners might expect. I, I speak around the country and I always ask the crowds this and I've never had one that guessed it right. I say, when do you think, what do you think year one of the Islamic calendar is? And they say, when Muhammad was born? Mm -hmm. Nope. When Muhammad died? Nope. When Muhammad became a prophet and received his first revelation? Nope. And those are the three I usually get. The fact is that the year one of the Islamic calendar is the beginning of the Hijra, when Muhammad left Mecca settled in Medina and became for the first time a political and military leader. And it's when Islam became a political entity, that's year one. And that indicates how deeply ingrained the political, the political aspect of Islam is within the religion itself. It is not a religion that teaches, as Jesus did, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and to God that which is God's. It is a religion that is essentially political. And the political aspect of Islam, the laws for the governing of a society, the laws for how a state relates to other states, are just as much considered to be part of the law of God himself as are the laws governing individual behavior. And this is rooted in Muhammad's own teachings. Right. You know, many more people on the right, myself included, have come to this understanding belatedly, but better late than ever, mm -hmm. I suppose. You know, the question is, like, you know, from a Washington standpoint, is there anybody on the left that is coming to this epiphany? Because it's only then that, you know, that there will be this embrace of, you know, the need to fight jihad mm -hmm. on the jihad battleground. None that I know of. I know that there's some individuals. Some people have written to me at Jihad Watch and said, I'm a liberal, I'm a leftist, I'm a Democrat and I support what you're doing and I appreciate that very much because I believe very strongly that this is not a liberal or conservative issue. This is an issue of national survival and civilizational survival and it's not as if the left for all the alliances that it has made with jihad elements is going to be spared from this the conversion or subjugation or violence imperative. Right, right. But you, know, you would think that, that there would be some awareness there. I mean, some of their pet causes, particularly you know, women's rights yes. and the protection of, of uh, homosexuals and civil liberties, you know, all the Danish cartoons, but you know, they were ducking under the table mm -hmm. you know, during, during all of those things. You would think so. Do you think, you know? But here's the thing. Do you think that learning about the life of Muhammad and how his life has affected how the jihadis uh, treat women now, for example. I mean, is that going to do any good? I mean, I hate to be a pessimist about it, but... <laughs> well, you know, you can lead a horse to walk. Yes, yeah. I mean, I'm trying to raise awareness of these things. Yeah. That's all I'm doing, just bring these things out into the open. Right. And so everyone can see that they exist. Uh, but the capacity for denial in human nature is extraordinary. And you take, for example, Lynn Stewart, the uh, lawyer for Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, who was recently convicted of aiding in jihad terror activity by passing messages from him to his henchmen outside the prison. And Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, of course, was the mastermind of the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, right. and he's now in prison in the United States. And they asked Lynn Stewart why she did this. And she said, I don't think that the struggle against racism and sexism can be carried on solely by peaceful means. Right. And I think the real